Hello, my name is Ed Gittry, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History, an affiliate with the Center for Human Computer Interaction, as well as project director for the American Soldier in World War II. I'm going to be joined a little later by uh, with Lee Lyle, who's going to talk about uh, his work um, with the center as well in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, I want to begin where this project began in uh, 2009. I was at the National Archives. It was a really warm Saturday afternoon. And uh, at the time, I was working on a book project on the uh, history of of social adjustment. I'm trained as an intellectual and cultural historian and I specialize in the interdisciplinary social and behavioral sciences. And I knew if I was going to tackle social adjustment in the mid-20th century, then I would I I'm, I had to um, tackle the 15 million Americans who uh, served in World War II and were part of the largest organization in US history. Uh, so I was at the National Archives. I called up a couple of boxes of microfilm reels. There were about 44, there were 44 reels in this collection and has a really nondescript uh, title. I knew it was associated with um, the war effort. So I called it up, put it on the microfilm reel, well, the, first, the first reel on the microfilm reader. And I knew within just a few minutes that I had something really, really unique um, that I had found. Uh, the, the U.S. Army created this in-house social and behavioral science research unit, um, and the idea was that it was going to collect human intelligence to help the Army become a more efficient and effective um, organization. It was also going to study the American, uh, Americans, the, the service um, men and women, um, to help them adjust and to improve their morale. They, they started their first large cross-sectional survey in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, the day after Pearl Harbor. And over the course of the next four years, from 1941 to 1945, they surveyed half a million uh, individuals. In addition to having soldiers fill out a number of multiple choice questions and some short answers, they also provided this prompt at the very end in most of the surveys, and they encouraged the soldiers, the respondents, to write about whatever they wanted. They were promised complete anonymity, so there was no fear of retribution. And they said, you know, let us know what you really about your experience and what you think about the U.S. Army. Here's an example from a 1943 survey on race relations, a really large uh, survey on race relations, and I think you can tell the race of the respondent when you take a look at this. Has Germany treated the Jews more harshly than the Southern and Northern crackers? The cracker treated the American Negro? Of course, the answer is yes, but they never claim to be a true democracy, and we have. They have me in the army, and there is very little I can do about it but at least please advance some more logical and truthful slogan than fighting for democracy. How can one fight for something one knows little or nothing about? Something that is the privilege of the chosen few. Of course, it's important to know that the, the US Army was uh, segregated at this point in time. Um, in addition to preserving all of these handwritten responses by uh, photographing them onto microfilm in 1947, the research director of the, the research branch took copies of file cabinets full of copies of the IBM punch cards that contained the survey data. And that collection is about, it contains about 200,000 individual level responses. So let's fast forward to 2014. I've been hired to teach Virginia Tech realize that there's a really strong connection with the military when I get here and I'm, I'm asked to teach World War II courses. Um, for me, teaching with primary sources is really important. Um, at the same time, you know, so it's always a struggle to, to personalize such a, a global conflict. And so I'm always looking for ways to personalize the experience, to make to humanize it so that 
uh, my students can can make connections and um, and uh, uh, empathize with the soldiers and what it was like to 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 live and to survive and to to fight in the war. At the same time, the university was really promoting and it still is promoting the hands-on experiential learning. I just knew that. Um, you know, I started to have this idea of, about doing this digital project based on these sources. And I knew that I would get more institutional buy-in here at Virginia Tech if I connected my research project to my teaching. So I put two and two together. Um, I said, like, what, what if I design a, a digital project that I incorporate into my coursework? Uh, so I would have my students transcribing these documents. Um, they'd be working with primary sources and they would be uh, learning and with these uncensored sources what it was like for Americans to serve in the army. Um, but they would also, at the same time, be producing something that would be of value to scholars, to stu uh, fellow students, to teachers, as well as to the wider public. So, I very sheepish, sheepishly uh, approached Professor Luther, Kurt Luther. At that time, he was uh, working with Paul Quigley, a colleague of mine in the Department of History, on mapping the 4th of July. Uh, so I asked him, like, can, I, can I use the platform that you've been developing for that project to experiment, experiment myself with this, this project that I'm thinking about doing? Uh, and he said yes. It worked really well for the purposes of that kind of that initial experimentation. Um, and it also helped us secure an, a federal grant, a startup grant uh, that we use for for planning and for implementation. Uh, but we, you know, we needed to transcribe sixty five thousand pages. That's a lot of pages to transcribe and tag. And so eventually, we decided to work with the largest crowdsourcing platform on the planet, which some of you, or maybe many of you know of, called Zooniverse.org, which has 1.9, uh, over 1.9 million members. Um, I thought to myself, you know, lots of people are, in, uh, are interested in World War II, members of the public, and also I, I knew because of the large user base and because it was so easy to use, uh, that it might be an effective platform for getting all these documents transcribed. Because not only did we need to get them transcribed once, but for quality control purposes, we wanted to get them transcribed at least three times. So we're talking over 200,000 individual submissions. Uh, but that was really, really important for me uh, that the initial experience we're working with Zooniverse because it kind of forced me to think um, across the cl classroom walls and the public square. Uh, so we started holding transcribathons, kind of like a telethon, where we would set these ambitious goals for getting a number of documents transcribed and tagged in a short period of time. And we teamed up with other uh, professors. I teamed up with other professors both here Virginia Tech and at other universities, and they incorporated the project, the transcription drive, into their classes. Um, but that initial collaboration as well with uh, Kurt was terrifically consequential for me. So in addition to collaborating with other historians and humanists, um, I also continued to collaborate with computer scientists and also you know, data scientists. Uh, I don't have enough time to talk about some of the work that I've done with Mark Embry and Fred uh, Felton and the CMDA program that's been really generative and important for the project. But I want to talk now and hand things over to Lee to talk about the work that I've done um, with his group. I reached out to Chris North early in 2019. At that point, we were really generating a lot of transcriptions. And it just seemed to me that a traditional monitor was too limiting, and I wanted to see if there were other platforms or technologies out there that would allow us or allow users to read, interact, organize, and make sense of a large data set, a textual um, a collection like we have with the American soldier. And um, so I'll hand things over now. Thank you.
I look forward to the Q&A at the end. Thank you, Dr. Gittry. My name is Lee Lyle, and I'm a CSPHD candidate specializing in human-computer interaction and augmented and virtual realities. I've worked on an interdisciplinary team between the computer science department and the history department has designed developed an approach we call the Immersive Space to Think, or IST, that assists people in understanding large multimedia data sets of a hundred or more documents in augmented or virtual reality. This sense making comes in many forms, in many different disciplines, such as what police detectives work on, journalism, or historical analysis. Dr. Gittry's data set is one such group of documents that we can believe can be more easily or analyzed and organized in IST. As you can see here, our initial setup is a wall or bulletin board with all the documents that researcher wants to analyze. We further support different interaction methods to assist the researcher. As you can see here, we allow users to manipulate documents with egocentric move and two-hand resize. We also allow them to select uh, words or phrases and then permanently highlight them on the document. We allow the user to create labels that act like other documents that they can manipulate and move and resize as well. We also allow users to annotate documents uh, where they create an uh, annotation and then they speak what they want to remember on that document and record for a later posterity. Uh, while currently it is in a Wizard of Oz technique where we have them uh, speak what they want to say and then we uh, type it, we are currently working on fixing that and making it more uh, a solo interaction. Lastly, I'd like to show you the search function where users can search for a word um, using labels and find all documents with that string in them uh, highlighted by, through their title bar. Uh, in the future, tools that we plan on uh, implementing include the keyboard control that allows uh, users to more easily enter their own data and their own thoughts and create labels and notes um, by themselves. Um, this is going to be on a wheeled cart so they can move it around as they move throughout the area. We also implemented a radial menu uh, so that they can create their own labels uh, more easily and own notes, free floating notes, uh, as well as save and load their layouts. Uh, we also plan on implementing an augmented reality version of IST. Uh, this way, users can transition more uh, seamlessly to other work or even use other tools such as whiteboards, laptops, and other forms of uh, data manipulation. We have performed one virtual reality exploratory study so far with Dr. Gittry, um, where we had an interdisciplinary for focus uh, between the history department and computer science departments. Uh, we used the data set of transcribed documents from Survey 32 on racial relations in uh, World War II military. And we used our four by eight meter tract area uh, to see how participants uh, and users would understand the data set as a whole and answer a historical prompt on uh, how racial relations affected views on democracy. Uh, we recruited 25 participants, uh, undergrads in a World War II class, uh, so that these participants would be interested in the topic. And we wanted to really have them connect with the data uh, and not just flippantly try to solve the exercise as quickly as possible. We had them create outlines of how they would answer the prompts uh, in essay form. We found uh, through this study that there were three main uh, layouts that people liked using uh, in uh, IST. And the first one was a semicircular layout where basically they are surrounded by documents and they can see all the documents pretty easily as seen here. Uh, the user can see, see and turn and see all the documents around them very quickly to reference or take notes on. We also saw a planar layout uh, where users would set up basically uh, concepts, topics, or themes, uh, relations uh, between documents, and then have one viewing point to see all of them on a plane. We also saw them use the environment. Uh, so this floor was uh, utilized so that they could see the bounds of the tract area and where to travel easily. But they would use these environmental cues or landmarks uh, in order to sort their documents. 
which leads to some interesting questions in how they would use environment uh, in augmented reality. We also found that users were able to understand the data uh, and identify concepts and themes across documents, which is, is very promising for uh, its ability to effectively perform sense making. So the future directions was we want to uh, create the augmented reality uh, implementation and then see how users will change their behavior between virtual and augmented reality. So we'll run a, um, a study which uh, has users use both um, versions of IST just to compare and contrast uh, how they actually uh, understood the documents. Uh, we also want to do a comparison study between our approach and other approaches, uh, including um, traditional just bunch of PDFs on a doc uh, on a computer where they try to understand them between documents, keeping notes in words or, or writing their essay in Word uh, as well. And we also want to look at other software tools that purport to uh, assist with the sense making process. Are there any questions? Welcome back. Um, Ed and Lee, that, what a great video. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that with us. Um, we do have some questions. Um, did you all want to comment on anything uh, about the video before we get started with questions? It speaks yeah. for itself, I think. <laughs> I hope. Wonderful. Uh, well, we do have some questions here. Um, can you talk about, um, Ben is asking this one, um, how does the partnership work between, you have a historian and a computer scientist, um, how does a partnership work and how can students from either discipline get to work on a project like this? Right, right. That's a great question. Um, I had some, uh, before working with Lee and his group, I had worked with Professor Luther, as I mentioned, and uh, because of federal, uh, federal funding from uh, an outside agency, um, we were able to fund a grad student. And so it was really easy to integrate um, that graduate student into the project because of that. Uh, and that really set the stage really, really well for working with Lee and CCI further. But Lee, why don't you talk about that experience? Uh, well, yeah, it was great. Um, during the design of IST, uh, we, we brought in Dr. Gitry many times uh, to give us feedback on how we were implementing uh, the various tools and if they were actually helpful. Um, and it was great to uh, really get a different perspective on what we were doing. Um, now, and we didn't always say the same, speak the same language, you know, say the same words uh, to mean the same thing, but working together, it really was, uh, was a good pro a process of, of redesign and, and iteration. Excellent. We see that a lot in ICAT, that that is the, uh, one of the major challenges of working across disciplines is that words mean different things in different disciplines. So that is one of the things that we just really start with. Uh, so, so good work on that. Um, so George is asking, after you have uh, three copies of a transcription, do you combine them in a single entry? And then how did you decide which interpretations are accurate? Um, so, I, uh, when I was working with the, the first graduate student with Professor Luther, um, we had done some research based on some uh, prior projects that have used Zooniverse and used this method. And uh, so the process is to, uh, that we're using is to, to pick the one where there's the most consensus on and to use that as the, as the one that, so there's no amalgamation of the three, but picking the one where there's the most similarity using uh, some scripting with an algorithm. Um, we started off with three uh, based on just what some of the other projects did, but now we've added a four and they're seeing an improvement in our results. So there's a lot of trial and error going on. And our goal at this point is uh, we're at the stage now where we wanna do some manual validation and we're working on an Omeka site with script that's it's just gonna be very temporary. So there will be human eyes that, that go over one final time, but it's a, it's a vast improvement to, to be working with the output uh, after it's been, has gone through that process of selection. Nice, thank you. Um. 
Tristan Miller has asked, uh, have you investigated the use of natural language processing to make sense of the text of deep dives? I think that's what you're just talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And would, would be glad to talk with you more about it. Terrific, yeah. I've, um, I partnered with Mark Embry in the CMDA program and uh, mentored a group last fall and I'm mentoring another one uh, this fall. And I worked with him and we got, um, a destination area grant to run a, a summer internship that was uh, focused on L NLP techniques. And when we started, uh, BERT was fairly new, an algorithm from developed by Google. And we implemented that using actually this, some of the same surveys that are part of this project um, and combining that with, with another technique. And uh, so we're trying basically experimenting with different techniques that we might both build into the project's website before when it's launched, but also to do some independent research, um, one on space, uh, on space spatial relations um, with respect to segregation. And so race and segregation is a big part of the project and it spills over. So you saw in some of the images that are used, those come from surveys dealing with race relations. So we're kind of building in questions about diversity and inclusion into the project using um, NLP techniques as well as a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I think this question is for probably for Lee. You talked about the, the virtual, re virtual reality environment. Where is that physically and what does that look like? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we use the uh, sandbox because it has a large um, Steam VR 2.0 tracked area. Uh, as I mentioned in the video, it's four by eight meters. Um, and I I didn't really cover this in the video, uh, but we we use the floor in the virtual environment to cover um, the tracked area. And anything beyond the floor, uh, you could run into obstacles. So we really wanted to keep that, uh, that visual cue uh, ready for all participants and all users to know that they, they couldn't go past that floor or they would risk you know, physical injury. Um, now what that area looks like, it, uh, that area around the floor is actually almost surrounded by desks and uh, computers. Um, on one end, there's even a couple of whiteboards um, that, that people often take notes on. Um, so that's what the physical area kind of looks like. Um, you can, you too can see it once uh, the Moss Arts Center is, is off of lockdown because um, we have a huge bay window uh, that can look down into the sandbox. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, this is from Doug and it's for Ed. Uh, what new historical insights or interpretations have resulted from these interdisciplinary efforts? Yeah, that's an ongoing uh, process. Um, it was really, so we, in the original testing, we used undergraduate students who were dealing with the race uh, surveys and uh, race, uh, focused on race relations. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting to me, and I, we've not really explored it in, a, in, a, in any of the testing, is, um, as I said, I'm interested in, in spatial relations and wondering how having a different physical space to read those documents might impact the way that they actually interpret them. Um, it's not something that we've gotten to yet, but I can see that in, in the future. Um, so it's, I, I don't know if I, I can answer that really clearly at this point, it's, um, it's yet to be determined really. But it, one of the things I really enjoyed watching the videos of the students is the way in which they used the technology in, a, a, in diverging ways. And so the ways in which they would group documents. And so that's one of the questions that we've re returned to on a, a number of occasions and wondering how the technology both enhances or extends uh, the habits of, of uh, students in the humanities um, uh, to, to enhance their reading and their analysis. Great. Um, one more question for Ed, this is from Andrea. Um, given that your overarching interest is in social adjustment, what are some of your specific research questions for the transcription project and initial findings? So that's, that's related. Right, right. 
so there is kind of a subtext to the, the project. Um, the front end is really uh, of the project is emphasizing the voice of voices of individual soldiers. Um, but the, the techniques that were used to elicit and to record those are products of the social and behavioral sciences. And so for me, there's a direct connection between uh, social adjustment, the techniques that are used both to measure, to measure, record, to analyze social adjustment. Um, so there's an intellectual backstory that isn't obvious when you first encounter these documents and, and, and the project. Um, so one of the things that first struck me about these sources, and it comes up in these race surveys, was the similarity in language used both by black and white soldiers to talk about their experience within this massive organization. And so you would have not only white soldiers, but also African-American soldiers asking for, uh, for testing and objective measures of, of, of one's skills and abilities. Uh, so we think of meritocracy being a, a, a bad word now, but uh, lots of soldiers were asking for these objective standards. And I thought that was really fascinating because of the way we talk about meritocracy in a really pejorative way. Um, but but the, really, the, the going back to the, the origins of it, I mean, this, the, the social and behavioral sciences played in a really important role in the US Army and the war effort in a way that's just not been recognized by historians and scholars um, widely. Great. Thank you. I see that we are reaching the end of our time. So I want to take a minute to thank you all very much. I also want to point out the Moss Art Center is open. So you may not see things in the sandbox happening right now, but the Moss Art Center is open. No worries. The gallery is open. There's some great new things uh, in the downstairs gallery, at least. Um, and we're, we'd love to have uh, folks come socially distance, wear your masks, all that, wash your hands. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who came out today. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Lee. And uh, we will see you next week, same time, same place for next week's Playdate. <laughs>